Hello, welcome to episode 3 of The Curious Homunculus, in which I video, document, and then talk nonsense over the top of games of Commander. Under the guise of The Curious Homunculus, a voracious little reader is trying to stuff all his knowledge of magic into the book you see flicking before your eyes. Uh, welcome back to my own particular brand of irreverent nonsense. I hope you've enjoyed the episodes that have gone up so far. And if you found yourself here by accident, welcome. Hello. Also sorry. Now, as previously established, I am terrible at self-promotion. Fortunately, you good people have been very assistive. Assistive? Is that a word? Yes, I'm English. I can therefore claim whatever words I like. Ooh, I'm British. I couldn't possibly self-promote. Ugh, get over yourself. Look, if you enjoyed this guy's video, don't forget to like it, don't forget to share and subscribe, and don't forget to hit that bell icon so you can get instant notifications. See? It's not that hard. You British dandy. Dandy? Well, that's just rude. So that was Dennis from the Commander Table. Thank you very much, Dennis, for doing that for me. If you'd like to see some of his content, I advise you to do so. I shall leave a link in the doobly-doo below. Right then, into the game. So Dan starts us off in turn order, playing an opulent palace, and says go. Lewis in turn plays a forest, Amelie plays a turn one mountain and then a soul ring, so of course she is statistically more likely to lose, apparently. I play a forest. Doesn't look as good, does it? No. A very similar play to my own, Dan plays an island. Passes the turn. Not wishing to lag behind the basic land race, Lewis plays a mountain. Not wishing to take part in this superior strategy of basic lands only, uh, Amelie plays a rugged highlands and gains a life. I draw for turn and play a forest, there it is, and then I bring out my commander, Ayula, Queen of the Bears. So Ayula is a legendary 2-2 creature, naturally, she's a bear, and whenever another bear enters the battlefield I can either put two plus one plus one counters on a target bear, including her, or I can hike a target bear that I control fight another creature that I don't. So this is my Royal Bear Force deck, which makes it legally distinct to the Bear Force 1 deck you may have seen on another channel. Um, my plan is to play bears, to make as many bear tokens as possible. Uh, failing that, as long as the card has a picture of a bear, that's okay. Or I'll make a bear pun. I hope it won't be too grisly for you. I make no apology for that. So some cards that I'm going to use in my deck to achieve this, uh, one of my favourites being Bearscape. Look at that artwork, absolutely brilliant. And then, oh I don't know, Four Bears Blade. Again, no apologies. Back at the table, Dan plays a forest for the turn. He then taps out and plays a fabrication module. So the fabrication module is whenever you gain an energy counter, you may put a plus one plus one counter onto a target creature you control, which given his deck is centered around entirely energy and plus one plus one counters, seems good. Lewis plays a planes for the turn, and then casts a Beastmaster Ascension, which is the sort of card that can get out of hand very quickly if you let him. Hopefully we don't. Amelie plays an Evolving Wilds for turn. Classic Commander staple. Amelie then plays Elemental Bond, giving her a great source of card drop as long as she's playing creatures onto the table. Spoiler alert, she will be. On her upkeep, she then cracks Evolving Wilds, looking for a plays and putting it into play tapped. I, in turn, play Akina, Temple of the Grandfathers for turn, which as well as making green mana is going to be allow me to give plus one plus one counters to Ayula and any other legendary creature bears that may happen to be in my deck. I then tap out and play Bearscape, which I, is a great little way of turning uh, dead creatures in my graveyard into bear tokens. It's not quite graveyard recursions, but uh, I'm very fond of this enchantment. Also, there are bears. Don't know if I mentioned those. I then swing Ayula at Dan at doing two commander damage, as he's always been to me, quite frankly. <laughs> Only in games of magic, I hasten to add. Lovely fellow. Now that Dan has taken bear damage, fam, uh, he then plays a forest for turn. 
Now using all of this mana that he's soon acquired, he plays a Bristling Hydra, which is a 4-3 creature that when it ETBs gives him 3 energy counters. And because of that fabrication module, because he's gained an energy counter, he gets to put a plus one plus one counter on the Hydra that just came in. This seems very good. Or at least this synergy. I'm easily impressed. Lewis just plays a planes and says go, which is much easier to edit. Thank you, Lewis. Amelie untaps and plays a forest for the turn. So Amelie taps out and casts a four runner of the Empire, which is just the most Vorthos card to play as your first creature in a deck based around dinosaurs. Brilliant. Um, it's not only a tutor for a dinosaur card, um, but it is also a pinger. So whenever a dinosaur enters the battlefield, uh, Forerunner of the Empire is going to ping every single creature on the board, including her own, but that might be a good thing because of enrage effects. My voice has gone high. The card in question that she chooses for is a Bellowing Aegisaur, so whenever it takes damage you put a plus one, plus one counter on each other creature that you control. Synergy. Again, my opponents with their synergy and I've just got puns. I in turn play a Forest, strong start. I then tap out and bring in a Golden Bear, look at him, beautiful. Uh, this triggers Iula and I elect to put plus two, pl two, plus two, plus two counters on Her Majesty. I then swing the newly emboldened Iula at Lewis, uh, doing four bear damage, uh, sorry, commander damage to Lewis. Yes, I'm going to make that joke a lot. Dan draws for turn and plays Temple of Deceit, which comes in tapped. So Dan taps four sources of mana and making use of his fabrication module gains uh, an energy and because he's gained an energy he puts a plus one plus one counter on his bristling hydra synergy. Lewis shocks in a sacred foundry taking the damage to keep it upright and then taps five sources of manager. Manager? Yes, five sources of manager, that well-known rule, manager the gathering. <laughs> Uh, it's not like you watch this for the tactical insight. So yes, with that five sources of mana, uh, Lewis brings in Girid, Conclave Exile, his commander, for his token effort deck. Why do I call it his token effort deck? Well, it's because all of his effort goes into making tokens. So yes, the first strategy is exactly that, to make tokens, whether that's by Girid himself uh, bringing in rhinos, and there are going to be lots of rhinos, or through other spells, tokens will be a thing. He's then going to make more tokens. I cannot emphasize the importance of tokens in this deck. He's then going to make use of as many populate abilities. Again, that strategy written right on Girid's card. And then he's going to dome his opponents with every single one that comes in. So a couple of key cards in this will be Song of the World, which means it will populate whenever a spell is cast. And equally impact tremors for each one that comes in, we're all going to take a damage. And that is pretty much Lewis's deck. So as Girard comes into play, Lewis pops down a foil rhino token. Seriously, who has a foil rhino token? I guess people that play Girard. So Amelie untaps and draws the bellowing Aegisaur that she tutored for last turn, taps six sources of mana including the planes, and then plays said little dino. So whenever he is dealt damage, uh, you get to put a plus one plus one counter on each other creature you control. Seems like it's going to get out of hand very quickly in result of lots of editing for me. Yay. Elemental Bond triggers and Amelie gets to draw a card, hoping for a land as she's missed her land drop this turn. Then, because a dinosaur has entered the battlefield, Forerunner of the Empire triggers doing one point of damage to every creature. This isn't enough to kill any of the creatures, but it is enough to enrage the Bellowing Aegisaur. And uh, all the creatures that Amelie controls gets a plus one, plus one counter. And it does that bloop, 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 bloop thing that happens on game nights, but not here, because... I don't have Jake editing this for me, or Lady Danger. That'd be nice. They seem like lovely people. Freely admit, not the single most impressive turn from me coming up. Uh, I tap three forests and cast Far Wanderings. Search my library for a forest, put it into play tapped and say gay. Yep, yeah, that's it. Not grand, but easy to edit. Uh, Dan draws for turn, taps some lands and brings in Roresk. Roresk? Ro 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 Rolesk, Apex Hybrid, who is a 4-5 Flample, who puts a plus one, plus one, sorry, two plus one, plus one counters on the Hydra when he comes in and also does a bunch of proliferating things upon death. 
That Hydra is now an 8-7 people. Dan seeks to answer the age-old playground question of who would win Hydras versus Dinosaurs. We don't find out this round, and Amelie takes 8 damage. Uh, Tapa Forest in the chat to pay respects. Lewis plays a Castle Garenbrig, which comes into play upright as he controls a forest. He then plays a circuitous route and goes rooting through his deck. That means something very different now I live in Australia. I need to watch that. And brings out two guild gates as they're coming in tapped. You might as well. So Lewis swings Girard at Dan, uh, triggering Girard, making a 4-4 Trample Rhino, which also goes at Dan. So Rurlesk blocks the Rhino, which has a 4-5, destroys the Rhino. And Dan takes two commandy damage off a fellow with a stick. And because two creatures have attacked, that puts two counters on Beastmaster Ascension, which A is hiding underneath that light glare, wonderful, and B is getting closer and closer. That seven is no longer a long way away. Amelie untaps, draws for turns, suspiciously doesn't play a land, thankfully, uh, and then taps an appropriate amount of mana and plays Harmonize, allowing her to draw three cards. Even after the Harmonize, Amelie seemingly does not have any lands in hand, moves to her end step and must discard a Frilled Death Spitter, which seems like it would synergize really well with that bellowing Aegisaur and Forerunner of the Empire, so I'm a little fearful of what she does have in hand. I draw for turn and play a Forest, seems likely really in a mono green deck. I then pay two and bring in Conda's Banner. So Conda's Banner is a wonderful piece of equipment that can only be attached to a legendary creature. And every creature which shares a creature type with that creature gains plus one, plus one. And every creature which is the same color as that legendary gains plus one, plus one. Everything in my deck is green. Everything in my deck is a bear. All of my green bears get plus two, plus two. Now, there is a slight bone of contention here at this point. As I had declared to the table that every single card in my deck had a bear on it. And Dan rightly asks, where is the bear on that card? So I tap the one and attach it to Ayula. So there, there Dan, there is the bear on that card. <laughs> After recovering from that onslaught of humour, Dan plays an opt for turn, a scrying one, liking what he sees and then draws it. Dan then taps two in a blue and casts stealth mission. Putting two plus one plus one counters on an incredibly sneaky bristling Hydra, which is steadily getting massive. Apparently now it can't be blocked this turn. I'm sure that'll turn out fine. Dan then moves to his combat step and swings the Hydra at Lewis. After all, he did hit him with a stick for two commandy damage last turn. It is an unblockable creature, so there's not a great deal Lewis can do about it. And if he can, he decides not to. So Lewis takes ten Hydra damage. Uh, well done, Dan. No dice rolled, no choosing combat steps at random, just smashing someone in the face with a giant lizard. We're very proud of you. After that onslaught of Hydras, it is Lewis's turn. He draws, um, untaps, usual stuff, plays, pays two and plays a Gruul Signet, because colour fixing is important. He then plays a Felden of the Third Path, allowing him to create token copies of creatures in his graveyards. Tokens, eh? Didn't see that coming in your deck, Lewis. Moving to combat, Girard is swung at me, which creates a Rhino, which in turn goes to Amelie. On Amelie's side of the board, the Rhino is blocked by the bellowing Aegisaur, so they bounce off each other, but this does trigger the Aegisaur so that the Forerunner of the Empire gets a plus one, plus one counter. On my side of the table, I elect to take the two points of commander damage, although I could kill Girard with Aeula at this point, as long as Lewis deals with the Hydra on Dan's board. Let us see if he is a man of his word. This, of course, because he has attacked with two creatures, put two further counters onto Beastmaster Ascension, bringing the total to four, and that magic number of seven grows ever closer. Oh, I love this little sequence that's coming up. So Amelie draws for turn, draws a card, untaps, taps, and then plays a Needle Tooth Raptor, which whenever it takes damage is going to deal five damage to a creature of her choosing. She then taps Selesnia and brings in a Siege Horn Ceratops, which whenever it takes damage, uh, gets two plus one plus one counters if it survives. This triggers the Forerunner of Empire doing one point of damage to every creature on the table, which triggers the Bellowing Aegisaur, which puts plus one plus one counters on all the things, plus the Siege on Ceratops gets plus one plus one counters, and the Needletooth Raptor does five damage to a target of her choosing, which is Roralesque, the apex of hybrid. 
which when it dies proliferates and puts two further plus one plus one counters on the bristling Hydra. <sighs> <sighs> Moving to her combat step, Amelie swings the bellowing Aegeosaur and the forerunner of the Empire at Dan, who takes 7 damage. Disappointed by Lewis's lack of creature removal as per our deal, I tap 3 forests and cast Beast Within targeting the Bristling Hydra, which sadly in turn spends 3 energy because that's a resource I'm used to managing, uh, gains a plus one plus one token, good, and gains hexproof, meaning my spell fizzles and achieves nothing. Reeling somewhat from that rather unexpected result, I uh, untap, draw for turn, tap five and cast Vivian Reed, who is a legendary planeswalker that's going to let me do a whole bunch of stuff, conveniently is listed on screen now. Uh, she does have a bear on her card, so there we go Dan. Uh, it's fulfilled. <laughs> um, I then uptick her looking at the top four cards of my library. I choose the Were Bear and put it into play into my hand. Where? Right there. Um, and then, not really wanting to anger Dan too much, and in need, I think, of Lewis and Amelie's help to take down that bristling Hydra, I say go. Over on Dan's turn, he draws, untaps, all that good stuff, and then taps four sources of mana and casts a Bloom Hulk, which when it comes in will proliferate. In response, Lewis, thankfully, pays a further three green mana and casts Beast Within, targeting the Bristling Hydra, and the Bristling Hydra does exactly what it did before. It pays three energy, gains a plus one, plus one counter, and hexproof, meaning that also Lewis's Beast Within will fizzle. However, Dan has no more energy. This is the last time he can do that. The Bloom Hulk then resolves from the stack and the Bristling Hydra gains a plus one, plus one counter. Hopefully now we can take it out, unless he suddenly has a source to gain energy, which he probably does. It's an energy deck. Moving to combat, Dan swings his 1413 Hydra at me. I chump block with the poor Golden Bear who dies and Dan passes the turn. Dan says go, and her majesty is not amused. Over on Lewis's side of the table, he untaps draws and then starts furiously tapping mana, which looks a little worrying. Fearing a hoof? No, in fact it is a Zendikar resurgent, meaning that whenever he taps mana, he's going to get an additional point of mana, and he then gets to draw a card, and then perhaps worrying a little bit about retribution and needing the need to keep up blockers, says go. Right then. Another one of those dinosaur turns coming up. Amelie untaps for turn, draws, still doesn't draw a land seemingly because Gishath remains in the command zone. But what does come out is a Tempia, Temple Altiosaur. So the Temple Altiosaur means that if this dinosaur would suffer damage, it reduces that damage to one. This triggers in turn Elemental Bond because it is a creature with power three or greater, so she draws a card. Also triggered is the Forerunner of the Empire because a dinosaur has ETB'd. This deals one point of damage to every creature on the table. In turn, the bellowing Aegeosaur triggers, putting a plus one, plus one counter on all her other creatures, including the Siegehorn Ceratops, which has triggered itself, so it gets a further two plus one, plus one creature um, counters on it. Also, the Needle Tooth Raptor, which, when it takes that damage, does five points of damage to a target of her choosing. She chooses, for some reason, Aula, Queen of the Bears, who's already taken one. She's currently a six-six, so Her Majesty dies and I put her in the graveyard. Moving to her combat step, uh, Amelie declares two attackers, one the Seachorn Ceratops at me, and two the Forerunner of the Empire at Dan, both of which are laden with uh, plus one plus one counters due to all the enrage effects. So I take eight damage and Dan takes five. So at the beginning of my turn, I untap and all that usual good stuff and up tick Vivian, taking a look at the top four cards of my deck, uh, choosing one to reveal and then place back into my hand. The card I reveal is Flaxen Intruder, which controversially has three bear heads on it, but does make bear tokens too, and that goes back into my hand. Now, if you're wondering why I put Ayula into the graveyard rather than my command zone, then wonder no more, because this is why. So making use of Bearscape and four mana, I exile four cards from my graveyard, and for each two, make a 2-2 bear creature token. And then because she has changed zones, I can put Ayula back into the command zone. So I've gained some tokens, which can hopefully 
help me chump block and protect Vivian, who should very soon go ultimate. And also I've cleared out my graveyard, which when you've got the Mimeo Plasm on the board, or potentially on the board, seems a very good idea. I pass the turn to Dan, who does all of the beginning of the turn things you'd expect from a man of his stature. Uh, he then taps an appropriate amount of mana and brings in his commander, the Mimeoplasm. So Dan's strategy revolves around his commander's ability to exile two creatures from other people's graveyards or of your own, and to copy one of those cards with an additional number of plus one plus one counters equal to the power onto the Mimeoplasm. I've probably explained that terribly. Equally, it should probably be pronounced Mimeoplasm, because he mimes things. But that isn't nearly as much fun to say, so I'm not going to. In addition to this powerful commander, Dan has built in an energy package that you've already seen in action. So really, his four real strategy points are A, generate some energy with cards like Fabrication Module that you saw come down very early in the game. And then with cards like Bristling Hydra, utilize this additional resource to uh, an additional effect, many of which we, as the rest of the table, don't have access to, making it quite effective. Thirdly, he's going to make use of peripherate effects to increase the number of plus one plus one counters on his uh, his cards, and, and as I've seen him do in other games, also peripherate counters like Infect or Poison that may be on other ones. Lastly, his principal strategy is just to be in Sultai, which is a very, very good colour combination. Anyway, back to the game. So as the Mimeoplasm enters the battlefield, oh I did say it after all, um, my graveyard has been entirely exiled by Bearscape, see, told you that was useful, uh, equally Lewis's graveyard is entirely compromised of spells at this stage, his tokens don't really get to his graveyard. Amelie on the other hand has that death spitter and Dan has Rulesk, um, and so those are the two cards he chooses. So he'll take the plus one plus one counters from the death spitter and make a copy of I can't rule this. I can't pronounce it. Moving to his combat step, Dan then swings the now 1413 Bristling Hydra at Lewis, who effectively chump blocks with Felden, which, despite being an excellent card, seems better than taking a Hydra to the face. It's worth remembering at this point as we move into Lewis's turn that he has Zendikar Resurgent out in place and not only will his lands tap for a whole bunch of mana but whenever he casts a creature spell he's going to get to draw a card. So with that in mind, uh, Lewis taps not enough lands as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> he then casts Verdant Sun's Avatar which well as being a big beastie, so he gets to draw a card as per the aforementioned Zendikar Rising, but also whenever he plays a creature spell going forward he's going to gain life. Good. He then casts Growing Ranks, meaning in the beginning of his upkeep phase he's going to populate. Yes, Lewis's engine is beginning to come online. Lewis then taps 5 and Selesnia and brings in Imara Tendaris, uh, meaning all his tokens no longer take damage. Equally, he's going to set off that chain of events where he draws a card, where he gains life. Things are looking very good for Lewis right now. Lewis then moves to his combat step, declaring an attack with Girid against me, who populates and brings in another Rhino attacking. The Rhino in turn going at Vivian, so I do nothing about the Rhino going at Vivian, and she loses four loyalty, and Girid I block with a bear that sadly dies. And because he's attacked with two creatures, Beastmaster Ascension grows ever closer. Moving on to Amelie's turn, thankfully, uh, she taps one and Selesnia and plays an Atsukan Seer, which is a little mana dork with a little bit of graveyard recursion for dinosaurs built in. Amelie then brings in a Raging Regiosaur, which is a little pinger, which will do one point of damage to either a creature or a player whenever it attacks. However, perhaps more importantly, it triggers Elemental Bond, meaning that she can draw a card, and she finally gets that last land into the play, into the form of a Gruul Guildgate, meaning that Gishath can make an appearance, all told next turn. Then of course there's all the other triggers, say Forerunner of the Empire triggers, doing one point of damage to everything, triggering the Temple Altiosaur to reduce that damage to one, the Bellowing Aegisaur triggers, the Siege on Ceratops triggers, the Needletooth Raptor triggers, and does five points of damage to the Healy Dinosaur that Lewis has in play, meaning no more life gain for him. Hooray! Moving to her combat step, Amelie declares the Forerunner of the Empire to be attacking me and her Siege on Stereotops to be going at Lewis. So I block the Forerunner of the Empire with a bear, which sadly dies, and a rhino is used on Lewis's side uh, to block the Siege on Stereotops. Now, due to uh, Imara, the rhino takes no damage, but still does damage to the Siege on Stereotops, so it gains further plus one, plus one counters. 
So the beginning of my turn, I untap and draw, as is tradition, and moving into my main phase, up, tick, Vivian. Having a look at the top four cards of my library, I reveal a jungle basin, placing it into my hand, which is a peculiar little land that when it comes into play, bounces an existing land back to my hand, but taps for both a forest and a colourless. Given that my board state is looking a little grisly, or rather not grisly enough, uh, I tap out seven mana and cast Welcome Home, which is the adventure mechanic from the Throne of Eldraine, summoning three bears onto my battlefield. And then, sadly, I say go. It is fair to say I am barely staying in this game, and I make no apology for that pun. So Dan, in turn, taps an appropriate amount of mana and casts an Aetherborn Marauder which when it ETBs will allow him to move any number of plus one, plus one tokens from a permanent air controls onto it. So he moves a mere six from the Bristling Hydra onto it, making an 8-8 eight, eight flying lifelink. That's a thing to worry about in future turns. Moving to his combat step, Dan declares an attack with a Mimeoplasm at Amelie, which, because it's copying Royalesque, is a 7-7 seven, seven with Flample, because that's a word. Uh, so Amelie takes seven commander damage. So at the beginning of his upkeep phase, due to growing ranks, Lewis gains himself an additional Rhino. Lewis then taps three sources of mana for six CMC, which still looks like cheating, and casts the not at all suspiciously shaped Armada Worm, which when it comes in, as well as being a 5-5 green trample worm itself, makes another one. Brilliant! Um, and then thanks to Zendikar Resurgent, he can then draw a card. Now admittedly, and Lewis would be the first person to admit this, he has done this out of order, but I'm rather grateful that he has. Um, he then taps three sources of mana for and casts Song of the World Soul, which is an enchantment which means when a heavier he casts a spell, he's going to populate. Not finished yet for the turn, or in fact not even close, he taps further mana and casts Via Pashira, Sage Life Crafter, which as it's a creature, triggers Zendikar Resurgent, allowing to draw a card, and because it is a spell of any kind, he uh, triggers Song of the World Soul, meaning that these newly appeared worms populate, which judging by their appearance, I think I know how that's done. And then further demonstrating that this turn could have been played in a very different order, Lewis then casts Impact Tremors, meaning which whenever a creature comes into the battlefield under his control, everyone else takes damage, which triggers Song of the World Soul, which populates a suspicious looking worm, which triggers impact tremors, and we all take damage. You ever get that feeling that you know how this game's gonna end halfway through? Yeah, <laughs> that's what's happening now. So Lewis moves to his combat step, and this one gets a little fruity, so I'm gonna go through it slowly and one by one. First of all, he declares an attack with Girid against me, and as soon as that happens, Beastmaster Ascension kicks in, and all of his creatures gain plus five, plus five. I, in turn, block with a bear, killing the bear. Boo. Girid populates, and he gains a five-five Trample Worm, except, of course, it's now a ten-ten Trample Worm, which is tapped and attacking and going in Amelie. Impact Trimmers triggers, and we all take one. With it so far? Good. So not only is that 10-10 Trample Worm going at Amelie, but also so is three 9-9 Trample Rhinos. Lewis understandably quite confident about this uh, particular combat step, but has sadly, well, funnily, uh, forgotten entirely about the Temple Altiosaur, meaning that if a source of damage would deal damage to another dinosaur you control, prevent all but one of that damage. So, Amelie's dinosaurs stack up and block all of these tramples with the exception of one point of damage and then all of their enrage effects triggers. So for those not keeping score at home, that's the bellowing Aegeosaur putting a plus one plus one counter on every creature, other creature that she controls. The Siege One Ceratops in turn and then gets two plus one plus one counters. And then the Needle Tooth Raptor does five points of damage to a target creature an opponent controls, which in this case will be Girid. And because he's already taken two points of damage from a bear, that seven damage, despite the buff from Beastmaster Ascension, is enough to kill him. Or rather, it isn't, but we thought it did at the time, so that's what happened. Uh, but yes, he has should have ten life rather than seven, so we made a mistake, but we'll go from there. After saying go, Amelie finally has enough mana, so taps Naya and five generic and brings in her commander, Gishath, Sun's Avatar. 
So Gishath is a whopping 7-6 trample vigilance and haste dinosaur avatar. She is a big girl, it is fair to say. Equally, whenever Gishath Sun's avatar deals combat damage to a player, reveal that many cards from the top of your library, put any and all dinosaur creature cards from amongst them onto the battlefield, and the rest to the bottom of your library. So it's fair to say that Amelie intends to swing with this big girl and get as many dinosaurs into play as possible and to overwhelm them with us. And she's also going to make use of Enrage effects, as you've already seen up to this point, to create a surprising amount of synergy from these tiny little lizards. Key to victory will be Gishath herself, although the deck is a little vulnerable to board wipes and meteor effects, just like the dinosaurs themselves. Now, a the couple of cards she's going to make use of, particularly in this deck, will be the Silverclad Ferostodons, who, whenever they are dealt damage, each opponent must sacrifice a permanent. Equally, a Goring Ceratops, which gives every single creature you control double strike till the end of the turn whenever it attacks. Terrifying. So when Gishath comes into play, that is going to trigger Elemental Bond, allowing Amelie to draw a card. It then also triggers the Forerunner of the Empire, which does one point of damage to every creature on the board, apart from Lewis's tokens. And here we go again. So that is the be Bellowing Aegisaur, triggered and enraged, giving a plus one, plus one counter to every creature she controls, including the newly arrived Gishath. Uh, the Siege Horn Ceratops then gets two further plus one, plus one counters on it, and then the Needle Teeth Raptor does five points of damage to the not at all suspicious looking Armada Worm, killing it. Which it shouldn't have done because we forgot about Beastmaster Ascension again. Amelie swings at me with a Regisaur and Gishath. I block the Regisaur with a bear for some reason, killing it and allow Gishath to go through for eight points of commander damage. Over the top side of the table, uh, Dan is swung at by the Siege Horn Ceratops, which is by now a 15-15. He blocks, blocks with the Bulum Hulk, which dies, but does do damage to the Ceratops, so it gets a further two plus one plus one counters. And because she attacked with a Regisaur, she can do one point of damage to either a creature or a player, and does so to Lewis, bringing him back down to where he started from. She then flips the top eight cards of a library, revealing all and putting any dinosaur creature cards into play. These include the Ranging Raptors, which is a, has a enrage effect, meaning that you can ramp for land, and the Thrash of Raptors, which, as long as she controls another dinosaur, which by this stage, pretty sure she does, gains plus two, plus zero, and trample. So, once again, the Forerunner of the Empire triggers doing one point of damage to everything on the table. Sadly, that means my bears die. The Bellowing Aegis all triggers and gives plus one plus one counters to everything she controls. The Siege Horn, Ceratops, once more gets even more plus one plus one counters. I think it's up to 19-19 now. Um, the Needle Tooth Raptor. We realise at this point that the Armada Worm shouldn't have died because of... Uh, Beastmaster Ascension, so this time it can, and then the Ranging Raptors allows her to ramp through her deck. And of course, because another dinosaur's come in, we get to do this all over again. So at the beginning of my turn, I uptick Vivian, looking at the top four cards of my library, revealing a forest, which goes into my hand. I then play the forest, bring back her majesty, Iula, queen amongst bears, pay the two to attach Condor's banner to her, declaring bear and green, giving her and any other green bear plus two, plus two. Cast Balduvian bears, uh, who gains from Condor's banner and triggers her majesty, putting a further two, plus one, plus one counters on her. Any other turn, I'd be quite happy with this. However, given the board state, I think I'm really only just sort of pandering to myself. Dan plays an island for the turn. He then taps out and brings in Oko the Trickster, you know, the, the other one, uh, immediately upticking it and putting a plus one, a plus one counter on the fellow who I think I've established I can't pronounce the name of. Down then swings Roylesque, who is of course really the Mimeoplasm, at Amelie, uh, is currently a 9-10 in the air. Uh, he then swings the Aetherborn, who is uh, an 8-8, with lifelink again in the air at Amelie. She can do nothing about this and takes a whopping 17 damage, and Dan gains 8 to lifelink. So at the beginning of Lewis's upkeep due to growing ranks, he makes a worm which triggers impact tremors. We all take a point of damage. With me so far? Okay. He then casts Parallel Lives, which triggers his other enchantment with the World Song, which makes it a uh, another worm, which triggers Impact Tremors, and we all take a point of damage. Everyone so far? 
Good. And of course, parallel lives now means that whenever he makes a token, he's going to make two of them. You then cast Girod, Conclave Exile, making two rhinos because of parallel lives. So three creatures have come in, triggering impact tremors three times. But also Zendikar Resurgence, so he draws a card and he's triggered the World Song, so he makes two more worms, which triggers impact tremors twice. All of which has done us a whole world of damage without really doing much and gaining a lot of tokens. It's all looking very good. Not quite done with us yet, Lewis casts Voice of the Many, allowing him to draw a card for each other opponent that has less creatures than him, which is everyone. This triggers Zendikar Risk Resurgent, allowing him to draw another card, which triggers Song of the World Sold, which I've continually mispronounced the whole way through, which makes two more worms, which triggers Impact Tremors twice, and takes Amelie out of the game. Lewis then moves to his combat step and doesn't forget that Beastmaster Ascension is out this time, so everything has plus five, plus five. He then swings with three rhinos and one worm at me, and three worms at Dan. There is absolutely nothing I can do about that on sort of damage, and that is me out of the game. The three 10 10 trample worms that are heading towards Dan, one of which gets blocked by the 8 8 bristling hydra, which has done very well this game, all told, killing it, but that does reduce the amount of damage that Dan takes to 22, leaving him on a mere 2 health, but alive and ready to untap. Time for some thrilling heroics. Dan, being somewhat against the ripes, really needs to gain as much value and as much life out of his deck as quickly as possible if he's any chance of not finishing a second here. So with that in mind, he taps one and a black and casts Die Young, a rarely seen black sorcery, uh, which allows him to gain two energy, which triggers Fabrication Module, which is going to put some plus one, plus one counters on to his commander, that combination of Mimeoplasm and card I can't pronounce them no longer gonna try to do so. He then taps four more mana and taps the fabrication module getting more plus one that plus one that counters for his commander combination before finally up ticking Oko the trickster to put even more counters onto his commander. Lewis has no way of blocking flyers, so Dan moves to his combat snap and swings his commander, who's secretly the Mimeoplasm, uh, hiding behind that fella for 12 commander damage, and then the Aetherborn Marauder, who is currently an 8-8 for lifelink in the air. So uh, Lewis will take 20 damage, 12 of which is from the commander, and Dan gains 8 back. Now I had wondered, with all of the counters that were going onto Dan's commanders, would those not be better served going onto the Aetherborn Marauder? to get more lifelink, but I can see what he's doing here. He's trying to whittle Lewis down through commander damage. It is a long shot, but it is probably the best one he has right now. And at this point, one worm swinging in would be enough to take Dan out of the game. So we called it a victory for Lewis and for Girid, Conclave Exile. So chapter three of the Curious Homunculus is very literally in the book that you see before you now. My enormous thanks and gratitude to Dan, Lewis, Amelie and John for being my opponents in these first three games. Please do not take it personally that I then emigrated 16,500 kilometres away from you. Also, don't forget to check out Dennis's content over at the Commander table. I shall leave a link in the doobly-doo below.